Hello, School Transportation Nation. I'm Tony Corbin, publisher of School Transportation News. Welcome to episode 52 of the podcast, brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. Our tech tip is brought to you by Zonar, a leader in smart fleet management. And we have a special message from Purell, America's number one trusted brand of hand sanitizer. Welcome back, Nation. I'm Ryan Gray, Editor-in-Chief of School Transportation News. A little bit later, we will be joined by Keith Kranz. He is not only the Wyoming People Transportation Association President, but also the Director of Transportation for Campbell County School District. All right, we'll look forward to that interview, Ryan. We've got some big announcements. The AASA announced the Superintendent of the Year winner, and it is... Dr. Michelle Reed of North Shore School District in Washington State. It's uh, northeast of Seattle. She was named the Superintendent of the Year last week during the National Conference on Education. It was virtually held by the Superintendents Association, AASA, as you just referred. We have a great article by Associate Editor Taylor Hannon at stnonline.com. One of our special reports last week, she actually spoke with Dr. Reed as well as the three other finalists and got their ideas and perspectives on the importance of school busing and school transportation in their operations. So don't miss that. Awesome. Congratulations, Dr. Reed. Great job. And uh, we also have another familiar face. Uh, NASDIPS was on the hunt for a new executive director as Mr. Charlie Hood has hung up his hat and retired. Who is our new executive director, Ryan? Well, Charlie's actually got a few more weeks under his belt. He's going to be hanging on through the end of March with Rana Weber. So a lot of folks will remember her name, a past executive director for the National School Transportation Association. She is back. Uh, She is the new executive director starting March 1st. So she'll be transitioning with Charlie. Uh, Again, a couple weeks ago mentioned, very sad to see Charlie go. I have a feeling he'll still be aligned with the industry, but we know Rana very well. She knows school busing very well. So great hire by NASDIPS. Wonderful. We'll look forward to catching up with Rana soon. Maybe we'll get her on the podcast. You never know, all huh, right? Absolutely. I already already broached that topic with her. So she's uh, getting her ducks in a row, getting the new gig set up. But yeah, she should be a guest soon. So stay tuned for that. Wonderful. Well, you know, I'm talking to a lot of people out there and uh, it is extremely cold everywhere. And even our friends down in Texas, I mean, some really bad stuff with losing power, losing water. Some people have some, not others. They're on a uh, boil water. Last week was just an absolute disaster. And it's just, you know, put a real big spotlight on the energy and the grid and power sources and things like that. You know, Ryan, you want to give us a little update on on what's going on in that in that state of emergency right there? Well, yeah, certainly. So it's not just our friends in Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Missouri. This polar vortex has dropped snow across, I believe, three quarters of America. 34 states actually are receiving federal aid. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration actually uh, responded to the winter storm and the heating and fuel shortages by releasing some much needed federal aid. So you can check out that article on stnonline.com. But definitely you hit the nail on the head there, Tony. Folks really suffering this past week. Hopefully this week things are starting to turn around a little bit. But you mentioned people were boiling water. They were actually going out and relying on the snowfall and then boiling that for water in a lot of places. Some of the folks I've reached out to in Texas, they said that the power is back on in their area. So that's good. But there's a lot of others that um, still were without power as we were heading into the weekend when we were recording this podcast. So uh, best of luck, prayers, best wishes to all them. Yeah, I guess in the the uh, virtual learning, you can kind of flip the switch and get everybody back in school, uh, at least virtually. I mean, that doesn't help the school bus industry much, but, you know, at least it uh, helps the kids get access to education. So we are uh, very familiar with virtual learning and, uh, you know, there it is. I guess we can put it in action, right, Ryan? 
Yeah, certainly, you know, what we saw last week in a lot of states is school was actually closed all week. We actually saw a pretty big news article that we won't get into regarding Senator Ted Cruz, um, kind of utilizing the snow days, if you will, to help his kids get to Cancun for the week. But, you know, certainly I saw a lot of schools were closed. But a lot of the conversation around this whole virtual learning, to your point, is that snow days could be a thing of the past. We don't need them anymore, really, because we can flip that switch and go virtual. Still not the same, but, you know, there's something that, that schools can utilize so they don't have to extend the school years. But as you mentioned, if there's too much snow, too much rain, whatever on the road, school buses won't be running. So our school bus friends, uh, I think they'll still be continuing to uh, utilize those snow days going forward. Yeah. You know, Ryan, another big thing that we're seeing, too, is uh, as a result of all this, energy prices are really spiking. And uh, I went to fill up my, my gas tank and I noticed it was significantly higher than I remember. Now, granted, I'm not filling up as much because I'm still working from home a lot. But uh, definitely we're seeing fuel prices rise across the country and it's going to really potentially have an impact on on operations. Right. People have enjoyed low fuel prices. And here it comes that that summer spike. I mean, I can almost feel it. Exactly. I filled up a couple weeks ago. I'm filling up about once a month, twice a month, if you factor in both my car and my wife's car. But yeah, certainly we're not driving the miles that we're used to, but suddenly it seems like we're paying like we are. You know, I think that fuel went up about 35 or 40 cents a gallon in just a matter of a couple weeks. Certainly that was not cool. Checked in with the U.S. Department of uh, Energy's Energy Information Administration. And speaking of diesel, they said that price per gallon rose by 13.8 cents last week and was only 1.6 cents cheaper than this same time in February of 2019, so before COVID-19. We've talked a little bit in the past about fuel hedging. Not every district really goes after that. Something that seems to be a little bit more popular with contractors, but certainly any operations out there that were able to lock in lower fuel prices during COVID, they are benefiting right now. Yeah. Speaking of hedging, you know, you really want to kind of hedge your risk right now with COVID-19. And we have a special message this week from Purell brand, America's number one trusted brand of hand sanitizer. Select Purell products that are now available for discounted pricing to support safe school reopenings, including Purell surface disinfectant. This revolutionary disinfectant is effective and worry-free to use on hot hard and soft surfaces without requiring any PPE or hand washing after use kills most organisms in 30 seconds and human coronavirus in 60 seconds. Contact your distributor for details or visit gojo.com slash 100 days STN. Be sure and visit them and check that out. Everybody needs to be uh, sanitizing, keeping clean during COVID. So important. I know many school districts have considered adding or have added hand sanitizer dispensers on the bus or are giving, you know, smaller versions out or or just promoting good hygiene. So big thing there. And Ryan, I know we've got a lot of districts talking about that. Anything on your front that you've heard out on that area? Well, we're going to be talking with Keith Kranz a little bit later. So he's one of those school districts that has implemented hand sanitizer. So he'll he'll talk us through how that's going. Wonderful. Well, Ryan, another big element, and I've heard it time and time again, President Biden, we've heard Kamala Harris, we've heard Nancy Pelosi, all of them had said getting back to school is going to require funds. It's going to require relief. And that's going to be part of this third coronavirus relief package. And there's just a lot there to dive into. You want to kind of break it down what the status of that is right now for us? Yeah. So the House has been marking up uh, their version of uh, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, We were hearing that it might pass 
on Friday when we were recording this podcast, but um, hopefully uh, by the time that this all reaches your ears out there in internet land, hopefully uh, we'll have some more concrete uh, specifics uh, as it moves over to the Senate. But as it appears, uh, not a whole heck of a lot has changed from the original plan that was announced in January. Still looking at $130 billion for schools, get, help them reopen. $1,400 stimulus checks added on to those $600 that we all got, or at least some of us got uh, at the end of the year. Of course, that is depending on your annual income. Also looking at expanding unemployment payments. So going from 300 a week, which it is currently, and that's actually set to run out at the in the middle of March. So Congress is really trying to get this uh, package implemented by then, passed by then. Looking to expand unemployment to $400 a week through August 29th, increasing child credits on your taxes. And it looks like the $15 minimum wage has not died. We thought maybe it did. There was a uh, Senate amendment that was passed uh, last month that uh, try to, to quash that and uh, move that on for maybe a later deliberation, uh, not tying it into this COVID-19 relief. But it appears that uh, the Democrats might be using what's called budget reconciliation to push it through without a filibuster. That's the needing 60 votes, at least in the Senate, to, to go ahead and pass a bill. Budget reconciliation would allow that 50 senator vote with Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, uh, tie breaking. You know, what we are thinking will happen, we don't know. We're, <laughs> there's just still a lot that needs to be uh, worked through Congress over the coming weeks. But basically, this budget reconciliation, it would bypass that 60 votes. And it would be allowed if it minimally affects or reduces the federal digit for a 10-year period. So we'll pay attention to that. You mentioned uh, House Speaker Pelosi. Tony, you caught her press briefing earlier this week. What did She mentioned school buses. What did she have to say? Yeah, so specifically she was talking about, I guess, her granddaughter goes to school in San Francisco, and she was just saying how much she wants school to reopen for her, too. And and when she started talking about the need for financial aid, she specifically mentioned school buses and social distancing and the funding to be provided specifically for acquiring more school buses, which I thought was very interesting because uh, someone so high up actually specifically mentioning school buses is is a great thing for our industry and and that they're starting to see the value in adding more buses and if we as an industry can access this 130 billion dollar relief package to add buses to the fleet i only see that as a good thing right that's going to help a lot of districts out access new equipment that they may not have been able to do otherwise and you know people have been taking budget cuts last year i mean it wasn't pretty, right? People go, they're looking for money. They're going to go to that CapEx budget. There's a lot of money sitting there. That's, you know, it's easy pickings. It's going to be reappropriated to other places. And, you know, I think the districts, you know, and the kids suffer because they can't get the newest equipment, the cleanest equipment, most technologically advanced equipment. And here's an opportunity for our industry to really seize the day and, and jump on this opportunity and, and apply for these funds. You got, you have to advocate. I cannot emphasize size enough. When this funds become available, you have to be talking to all the stakeholders, your CFOs, your superintendents. Be sure you advocate. If you don't, you'll miss out. And and you know what? The, it's going to impact the kids. So be sure and take advantage of that. But Ryan, I really, I really feel super strong about how this package is really going to help schools. And, and it gets me excited just thinking like all the aid that we could get and, and how much it's going to help our industry. Well, and it's important to remember that there's still a lot of money from the previous two stimulus packages. So we had the CARES Act that was passed last March, signed into law, and then of course, Consolidated Appropriations Act in December. There's still money from CARES Act that's uh, trickling out. Um, and then we have the money from the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And then again, we'll have this additional $130 billion, it looks like, uh, so there will be money for a while that will be rolling out. Speaking of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, 
And likely you mentioned San Francisco, a lot of school bus contracting up there. The school bus contractors, along with their partners in motor coach, over the road busing and uh, the passenger vessel industry, they're still trying to get their money from the CERTS Act, which was passed during the Consolidated Appropriations Act at the end of last year. So we've talked about this again. It was of eight billion or so that they requested. They got two billion that they're going to have to carve up. We had mentioned last podcast that NSTA, the National School Transportation Association said that school bus contractors lost $4 billion last year in revenue, and they're estimating to lose another $3.75 billion this year. So certainly you look at those numbers, you look at the $2 billion that's available in the total CERTs package, something's got to give, right? So we've talked about that there has been a movement to try to get more money from Treasury, certainly to get Treasury to to release that $2 billion, first of all, and then maybe get some more money into this American Rescue Plan. All of those efforts seem to be falling by the wayside. Checked out a, a UMA, United Motor Coach Association, town hall meeting last week, and Becky Weber, who, Ronna Weber, Becky Weber, I believe Becky is her sister-in-law. Becky's with Prime Policy Group, a a lobbyist firm for both UMA as well as NSTA. And she kind of took some some operators, business owners, through what's going on in D.C. right now. There's $30 billion that public transit is set to receive from this American Rescue Plan. In addition to all the money they got in CARES Act and Consolidated Appropriations Act, there was an attempt to try to get some of that money and move it over to motor coach and school bus. That didn't happen. But those efforts are ongoing. They're they're keep lobbying to try to get more of that money. So again, hopefully some more relief will be flowing soon. Yeah, you got to get more creative in these times, Ryan. And uh, this tech tip is brought to you by Zonar, a leader in smart fleet management. Engines run best when they run on the latest software, but taking buses to the shop just for an update costs valuable time and money using the free mobile app Zonar OT Air. Authorized personnel can download the latest Cummins engine software update over the air in as little as five minutes, anytime, anywhere, completely remotely, no in-person contact, and at no cost. Who doesn't love that? Learn more at zonarsystems.com slash OT air. That's zonarsystems.com slash OT air. So, Tony, earlier you said how nice it is to see someone high up in federal government mention school busing. Well, I'm going to raise you from the Speaker of the House to the President of the United States. That's right, President Joe Biden on Friday during a press conference in Michigan talking about the needs that schools have to reopen. Quote, more bus drivers. We need more bus drivers, unquote. Our uh, publisher emeritus, Bill Paul, co-founder of STN, our crack reporter was on the scene or maybe remotely. He captured that for us. Speaking of which, U.S. Department of Education follow up on uh, Centers for Disease Control guidance with its own strategies for safely reopening elementary and secondary schools. And it includes some uh, more specifics on transportation. It's always hard to, again, to find those specifics. And it's good to know and hear that busing, school busing is in the vernacular right now. It's being talked about a lot. So you can go ahead and and head over to our website, stnonline.com. If you scroll down to the bottom of the homepage there, we have uh, resources. It's in the bottom right hand corner. And if you click on safety, you can go over there and check out more information on what uh, the U.S. Department of Education is saying. Not a whole lot of new stuff here. I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise. A big push again on masks right now. We keep hearing about that. You got to be wearing masks. Not very popular with everybody across the nation. Uh, Associate Editor Taylor Hannon is working on uh, articles on that, talking to some school districts that are saying, hey, we don't require masks and we don't plan to. Here though from some of our our legal friends saying you better so more information is coming out on that u.s department of education also talked about opening windows you know increasing that circulation we have a big article coming up uh here in the beginning of march on in the magazine on ventilation systems talks about seating one student per row alternating window and aisle seating skipping rows when possible seating members of the same household next to each other You know, a lot of the things that we have been hearing talks about 
the plexiglass partitions. But something that, that jumps out here is that the DOE warns that if school districts don't follow some of this guidance, especially the face masks, they could face withholding of funds, federal funds. So again, we talked previously in one of the podcasts about some uh, you know guidance from the CDC that said there could be some criminal penalties on writers, passengers, and they're, they're talking about public and private busing who refuse to wear their masks. Now we're hearing from the Department of Education that they could withhold funds if you don't require masks on your school buses. So, you know, certainly... Uh, as we move more toward a full reopening of schools, more information, more guidance is good, but certainly things to arm yourselves with, knowledge to cultivate in your school district and talk to your legal representatives, talk to your school attorneys, make sure that they are providing guidance and you're not just willy nilly making decisions. Yeah, Ryan, I think no matter what, mask wearing, sanitizer, taking bus attendance, you know, the way we've done things in the past is completely changed. And some things, frankly, they're probably going to be changed forever. You know, like taking bus attendance, for example, there was a time when we didn't seem to think taking bus attendance was necessary. Some districts do, but many didn't, right? Many did not. And now it seems vitally important so you know where every bus is, where every kid is, and TransFinder has multiple ways to take attendance. With their easy-to-use driver app, Wayfinder, drivers can tap a student right on the screen and get an approved tablet of your choice. And then also, you can use their Wayfinder app with the Zonar Tab Active 2 tablet and ZPass Reader. Wayfinder works seamlessly with Zonar to take attendance and get real time updates into your Route Finder database and Stop Finder parent app. It's that easy. Call 800 373 3609 or email marketing at transfinder.com to learn more. Mention STN podcast when you call or email them and get a special gift from TransFinder. Well, Ryan, we have a special interview coming up with you and Keith Kranz from Campbell County School District in Wyoming. Look forward to hearing you guys. Take it away. Everybody, let's welcome to the School Transportation Nation stage Keith Kranz, Director of Transportation at Campbell County School District in Gillette, Wyoming. Keith, thank you for joining the nation today. Well, you are welcome, and uh, thanks for having me, and um, I'm looking forward to this. Absolutely. So I, I like to do a little research on the towns where some of our guests are, and was interested to learn that Gillette in the northeast uh, corner of Wyoming is referred to as the coal capital of the U.S. So a lot of coal there. Obviously, there's a lot of coal in the news. Uh, I think Keith mentioned to me a little bit earlier, the folks there are a little bit apprehensive about some of the uh, news coming out of Washington, D.C. So, you know, Keith, one thing that I've seen recently is fuel prices starting to go up. What's kind of the feeling around town right now? You know, just like you mentioned, um, our community is very apprehensive. So we are um, we are located at what they call the Powder River Basin, which runs for about 100 miles on the eastern side of the state. And we are right in the center of that, which makes us that largest coal producer in the U.S. So our economy and our tax base has been largely based on fossil fuel taxes. So not only do we have coal here, we also have oil and we have gas. But coal has been the largest producer of, of those two. We've already had a couple of coal mines that have either restructured and or closed up. We have one, one of our largest coal mines, which is about 40 miles south of our community, is announced that in a two year time period, they will sell. And there's a chance that they're going to you know, close the mine here in Wyoming. And that's um, about 500 employees. Oh, yeah. Of course, we have our Green Bus Summit coming up in April, and we are going to talk about uh, not coal, but we will be certainly talking not only about electric, because electric, everyone's talking about that right now, electric school buses, propane, but also the role that diesel is playing and a lot of you know, talk about renewables. So a, a lot there to, to jump into. But, you know, speaking about the, the coal industry there, has it been something that traditionally has 
competed with you for school bus drivers? Is that something where maybe you, you have you ever had shortages over the years because maybe uh, folks, they, it's more lucrative for them to go work in the mines? We have. We don't so much compete with the mines as far as drivers, but just employees in general. What we actually compete with a lot with the driver side is we have busing companies that provide transportation to the miners to and from the coal mines. And we compete with them heavily on actual bus drivers, whether a school bus driver or a transit bus driver or a coach bus driver, it uh, takes the same qualifications with the exception of the school bus endorsement. So we compete heavily with them. I think a lot of, a lot of districts across the nation, we always are shorthanded with drivers and try to fill our staffing. In our community, we typically have about 150 bus drivers on staff. And at any point in time, we'll have 10 to 12 positions open and available that we'd like to fill. Now, with the fossil fuel crunch and the, uh, and the slowdown in the, in the coal production, now we do have some employees coming back that are looking for jobs that we can fill. Unfortunately, knowing that in that you know, traditional role as a bus driver, not having a uh, 12-month position, not getting overtime, not getting eight hours a day, creates people to always be looking for something that pays a little bit better and might offer a, a full-time employment. And also, too, uh, it's my understanding, just talking with the different state directors uh, for Wyoming over the years, that that coal industry has really helped the funding for schools and specifically for transportation. Part of the apprehension you must be feeling, you and your cohorts, is what that's going to do to school funding and, and transportation funding. Absolutely. In Wyoming, all of education has traditionally been funded from the mineral taxes from their fossil fuels. This year, they're already seeing a hundred million dollar shortfall in that funding. And they're, of course, going to pass that on to districts. And it's creating quite an angst as far as for sure where those cuts will come from and what areas that we may not be able to offer services that we have been able to provide in the past. And I know that Wyoming was one of those states that wasn't affected at the same level, I will say, as a lot of states and districts across the nation when COVID descended upon us last March. For the most part, when the new school year started, it was about as normal in this abnormal year as could be really, wasn't it? Take us, take our readers through that. What's your, your normal ridership? You mentioned you have 100, about 150 drivers. What is your normal ridership student-wise and what has it been this year? Has there been social distancing you had to do? What's that? What's transportation look like? We were surprised. Our district in our reopening plan had put out a survey to parents about what they would like to see if we were able to have in-classroom education. And by far, most parents wanted in-class learning. And one of the questions that was asked was, if transportation could not be provided, would you be willing to transport your own students to school? And 75% of the respondents said, yes, they would. So we did not know for sure, as we put our transportation reopening plan together, what that might look like. Traditionally, we transport about 4,500 students out of a 9,000 student population. Now, with the reduction in the coal production, reduction in jobs, our district's down to about 8,800 students. So as we put our plan together and started scheduling bus routes and scheduling you know, students to ride, we thought that we might see a, a pretty large, significant reduction in how many students we'd have ride. We actually are transporting more today than we have in years past. We are transporting uh, between 45 and 4,700 with our last count. So, you know, we were, we were kind of surprised. Of course, with our reopening plan, we had um, put out there that masking would be required, that social distancing would be maintained when all possible. And even with those guidelines, we still have the same ridership that we've had in the past. Wow. And so you have you had to buy new buses? How have you, how's your team worked around that? So we hadn't had to. So we definitely did. We always have, of course, a certain amount of spare buses or additional buses down, you know, in, in the pool that we can draw from. We have had to add three additional new routes this year. So in our reopening plan, we wanted to limit our, as a matter of fact, even the state health policy or health orders is what they call them in Wyoming, limited uh, the capacity to 50 on a bus, on school buses. So the buses that we had more than 50 on, 
we were able to hopefully make adjustments with neighboring routes and transport five or 10 kids from one bus to the neighboring route and maintain 50 on most. We did have to add three new routes where we couldn't do that. And so we can maintain our 50 max on a bus. So you mentioned the mask wearing has basically been in place since since day one. Also understand that hand sanitizer has been added to school buses. Absolutely. So on our buses, we, in our reopening plan, when it comes to the actual student ridership, it was going to be maintain social distancing when possible, because we do have some of those rural routes that maybe only have six or 10 kids on. And if the bus is large enough, we can go every other seat across the aisle and maintain social distancing. And of course, those kids do ride longer. So for the comfort of it and to maintain social distancing, if that could be done, then those kids were allowed to ride without a mask and only wear their mask when getting on and off the bus. That only happened on a very few amount of buses. So rest of buses, then yes, masking was required. And we also put hand sanitizers on the bus as they come on. And we found out that not everybody can use traditional hand sanitizers. So, you know, most of it's always alcohol-based, and we have some folks that are allergic to that. And we were able to find hand sanitizer that doesn't use alcohol and would take care of the folks that are allergic or have allergic reactions to traditional hand sanitizers. So we have that on all of our buses as they get on and off the bus. For cleaning-wise, we ask our drivers between shifts, between runs, that they will do a wipe down with sanitizer. And then also we use the electrostatic sprayers, and we do that four times a week on all of our buses. In the spring and the fall, and we started school, of course, the weather was nice. We use our vents, we use our windows open, our roof hatch vents to create as much airflow as possible, which was a recommendation from the CDC guidelines, recommendation from STN on the articles that were put out that maintain as much airflow as possible to hopefully uh, control the virus and the uh, stagnant airflow that you might get on a bus. We additionally even added additional filters to our normal heater filters, and we spray those down with that sprayer as well when we do our sanitizing. Okay, yeah, I was going to ask you about ventilation, because certainly in a cold, cold weather state like Wyoming, I think you said it was in the 20s today when we were recording. So that's something we've been... Uh, talking to a lot of districts about for months now, even back when the weather was nice, we were like, well, wait a second, what's going to happen when things get cold? So you mentioned a, a lot of um, upgrades there. Also, too, I understand that there's a, a hands-free RFID time clock that you've implemented for drivers to try to you know keep the, keep the high-touch areas cleaner, probably. Have you tapped federal funds at all to pay for some or all of this uh, new technology or this, these new cleaning, new filters? We have. So the COVID relief funds that were, that were available to almost every district, I think, around the nation, um, a lot of those funds were used for preparing for distance learning when that was needed. I think a lot of those funds were used for schools and for school buses in the cleaning supplies, the, the masking, because we, obviously we know that not all, all kids always bring their mask with them, so we need to have additional masks available. So yes, a lot of those funds were used for the sanitizing machines So before this ever started, we actually had a hydrostatic sprayer that we used during the cold and flu season, and we would do it occasionally on our buses, and especially if we saw a bus that we had quite a few kids that were sick on. So we were using a um, sanitizer that was good for cold and flus. I don't know for sure what that chemical would be, and it was a plug-in type sanitizer, and we were already using that in years past. Now, when this came out and we knew that we would need more sanitizers, we used those funds to buy battery operated sanitizers. So now we can just go walk the lot versus having to have the buses pull into a stall and use electricity or plugged in sanitizer. And I understand on your wish list, Wi-Fi is one of those things. What else are you looking to implement as we uh, move into the future? You know, as far as anything for COVID, we think we're there. We did look into the barriers on whether or not we would want to put separate barriers in the buses, but we uh, went with the masking instead. As far as anything else on our wish list, the like you mentioned before, we did look at hotspots before making all of our, you know, not all of our buses, but having about 20 buses be available with hotspots. So if we had an area of a subdivision where students needed to get access to the Internet, then we could bring the bus into that area and they could actually, you know, log into that bus's um, Wi-Fi service to get their distance learning materials online. We didn't have to do that. Very, very few of our population wasn't able to get access to Wi-Fi. So if it was to come back, we would look at that again just to make sure. Other than that, we really 
prepared ourselves pretty well as far as materials needed and supplies that we would want. Okay. What about other things, non-COVID related? Camera system upgrades, tablets that are really big. Any of those kind of technology wish list items that you're looking at? We do. We have, we actually right now utilize the program called Here Comes the Bus. It tracks where the bus is at and lets parents know that. The next level of that is actually tracking students, where students would uh, scan an RFID card or even just a, a barcode as they get on and off the bus. And now it lets parents know that their child got on the bus and or got off the bus and exactly where and when that would happen. And at the same time, it would provide a tablet to drivers, which is great for new drivers, because it would provide turn by turn directions. That's on our wish list for the future. Obviously, right now we're going through budget crunches and time. So we'll see how that works out in the next two to three years. Yeah. Imagine you're uh, putting together your budget requests right now for the new year. And as we were mentioning at the top, some concern about uh, revenue, state revenue, and how that's going to trickle down and how you guys are going to be affected. Are you hearing anything in terms of the influx of all the federal funds that maybe the states will be looking at that and looking at a case by case basis and saying, oh, you've gotten such such and such money from the feds. We're going to reduce your normal reimbursement, anything like that? Is it still kind of all being, you know, hashed out? You know, as, as far as when it comes down to transportation, Wyoming is fairly unique. That transportation is not part of the normal education. They call it a block grant model. So where districts get funded for their classrooms or teachers, their everyday needs through this model, transportation is funded outside of that. Our state did a wonderful job in the last two to five years of doing efficiency studies, and transportation was a big part of that. And so uh, there were some changes made to transportation, the biggest one being the length of a bus cycle before it could be replaced. The other ones would be is making sure that districts are utilizing technology to have the most efficient routing as possible, to make sure that transportation is sharing resources with neighboring districts where maybe if a bus breaks down in one, they can borrow a bus from another. When buses break down within other districts, to make sure that we use our own resources, our own parts, mechanics that is in that district to repair that other district's bus, not have to pay an outside vendor for that repair. So it's in transportation. They did this efficiency study, and our numbers actually came down a little bit over the last couple of years. And at this point in time, transportation looks like it'll be funded as it has been in the past. All right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you and all your peers there in Wyoming. Keith Kranz, really appreciate you taking us uh, into your department and and giving us a look at how COVID-19 has affected you and where you guys are uh, looking to go from here. Thank you again. Really appreciate the information. Great. Thank you for having me. Hey, special thanks to Keith and Ryan. Really enjoyed your guys' conversation today. Really appreciate our sponsors, Transfinder, Zonar, and Gojo Industries Purell brand. Thanks so much for supporting this podcast. We appreciate you guys. Remember, you can visit stnonline.com for more news, information, and stories on COVID-19 and everything impacting the school transportation industry. Subscribe, stream, and review. We love Love those five-star reviews. Check that out and share this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We really appreciate you listeners. Thank you so much. Be sure and email us at info at s10media.com with your questions and comments. We love hearing from you. Reach out to us anytime. We're always here. We love you listeners. We'll see you next week.